Insane in the Membrane. Hello and welcome to another edition of your favourite podcast, Insane in the Membrane, with me, Rich Wilson. And this week I'm joined by the brilliant Benji Waterstones. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good, good to see you. Uh, where in the world do we find you? In my teeny flat in Brick Lane, yeah. Nice. No, we, yeah, I think yeah. anyone living in London's got... I don't know anyone that's got a vast amount of space at the minute. Well, yeah. Ours is literally a two-car garage in size, 400 square feet. So I've just had to <laughs> kick my partner out. Whenever one of us has a meeting, we have to kick the other into the park, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I have that as well. We've just moved to a, a place in Worthing, and it's um, it's lovely, but it's small. And like she she works from home during the day, so yeah. If I'm yeah. if I'm recording, I have to go and stand in the kitchen or something, which is a more of a galley, really. <laughs> Mate, we've got we've got that, and as well when like in lockdown, like we'd continue having our therapy on Zoom, but the other could you just oh. be having it in one room. You'd be telling your therapist about an argument, and through the other room, you just hear my, my partner going, "It wasn't like that." You just hear every word of the thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I forget. I I did therapy via Zoom as well, and um, in between the lockdowns, and uh, yeah, I, my um, my flatmate uh, Sweeney used to have to go and ride his bike, oh. or you know, I'd make or I'd make sure he was at work at least. Not that I don't think to say about him. It's just that you know, there's some personal stuff in there, and well, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, this is what yeah, we have to yeah. do, isn't it? The, the modern times we live in now, we're doing therapy via computer screens. I know, I know. It's funny though, because in that people really relax that kind of working from home model. I think because my therapist at one point, he was he was giving me therapy while he was driving. He, oh wow! Yeah. So. Um, yeah, everyone got a bit more relaxed with the working from home, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked it though. I, I, I after the first sort of few minutes when I got into it, I actually, I actually quite liked it. Um, I didn't feel because there's always when when I've had therapy before and you go to their practice or you wherever they're doing it, and it it's a bit daunting to go to a strange place. Mm. But doing it via Zoom, I actually once I got used to talking you know via the camera it actually felt all right and then and then when you're finished you haven't got to get the bus home you're already there yeah yeah now there is that there is that yeah so how are you doing anyway are you well i'm not too bad yeah um i'm having quite a, a um i've just handed in this book i've been writing on monday so that's a, right. that's good that's quite a big landmark for me i guess and um I'm sort of my work life is quite relatively chilled at the minute because I'm just like locuming, which means you can pick and choose how much you work as a doctor, which is kind of okay. nice for when you've got big deadlines and stuff. So, um, yeah, all is good with me, really. I've just got fat. I just I say we'll that. Talk- I say that. Yeah, I yeah. say that. I've just opened my uh, emails. You know, life's good until you open your emails, I think, sometimes, isn't it? Like, I used to do that. I used to just, like, not put my open my fo- put my phone on until, like, 1 o'clock, and then I'd have a whole morning of, like, getting some nice writing done. And then you put your phone on, the problem sort of starts. I opened my emails this morning. I've just got the latest family member who's unhappy with, like, my book and won't consign a, sign a consent form, and it's just, oh. yeah, that's a bit of a nightmare, yeah. Oh shit! But that's the that's the difficulty, um, isn't it? When you when you do try to talk about these things, people not everyone's on board with that, you know. No, I, I think, yeah, especially when it's yeah, if they they don't yeah they don't want to admit maybe that maybe their behaviour was was a bit questionable or whatever it is, it's a bit too personal for them or because um, I know I've had conversations with close family members about things that happened when I was a kid. And they're in complete denial. They kind of they, they, the way they talk. It's like, and I'm like, what is this life that you lived then? Because that's not how I remembered it. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, and if I was to if I was to mention it in a book or on stage, they, they I imagine they'd raise their hand and go, "Hang on a minute, that's not what we did." And I'm like, "Why?" Well, well they okay, totally. Yeah, difficult, difficult, it, difficult. And there is no real objective truth with these things, is there? There's just everyone. Everyone's got a different version of their story of how it really was. But, and also I do feel sorry for my, my family on one level because I'm just from that generation that is 
maybe a little bit irritating, like oversharing, perhaps. You know, we're trying to do things a different way, aren't we? Instead of brushing stuff under carpets and pretending it didn't happen, which was the old-fashioned approach. Um, yeah. We're being encouraged to do things a bit differently, but not everyone's quite on board with that idea yet, you know. I know. I think, yeah, we're the the first sort of generation that maybe over, like you said, oversharing. But what will happen is, with, as, with all these things, as you know, there's this massive overcorrection until it comes back to kind of middle ground, more, everybody's more at ease with it all rather than we're all going, yeah, I, this happened. And everyone's like, whoa, all right, mate, I just asked you if you wanted, to, if you wanted a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, totally. Society's like that, isn't it? It just swings from never talking, pull your socks up, stiff up a lip, to then like, I guess, you know, the Prince Harry model of like bearing everything to the world in a book. And then everyone's like, well, hold on a second. That's too much. I guess you've got to find that that healthy balance. Yeah. Well, especially with the life he's led. I mean, you know, the awfulness, the awfulness that he's had to deal with. And now he's finding the space to talk about it and go, look, this is what about, but because he comes from a privileged background, people are like, well, so what? You, yeah. you haven't got anything to worry about. You go, no, his mum was killed. That's I know. that's something you're never going to get over, regardless of your background and your privilege. That's still a yeah. horrible thing to have gone through as a child. You know? Yeah, no, totally. We need to get over this idea that people with material wealth can never have any pain, you know, or still not have a shit life. Mm. It must have been a very weird existence for him, mustn't it? Like being told he was this spare and like, what is he, what is his purpose in life really? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It must have been a weird one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've heard through doing gigs, um, for the troops now years ago, I heard that he was, a, he was a, he was a top boy. Like, you know, he's made mistakes, and he's, but on the, like fundamentally he's a, he's a lovely lad. From what I can gather, right. which which blows my mind with the amount of hatred that him and and his missus get, you know, and it's just but that's just the, that's what happens when you're in the public eye. People just they use yeah. they download all their bullshit from other places, and because you see some of it, and you go, "What the fuck? Why are you? What is this? What is this? Yeah, just leave them yeah. alone. Let them get on with it. They're, you know, they're not they're not these these. She's not evil. He's not evil. What are you doing? It just. It just yeah. baffles me. I suppose that's just human nature with a lot of people, isn't it? It's just how we are. Yeah, yeah. And I guess like people might think, oh, it's not the right way. The way he's gone about it is not very kind of respectful or proper or, or decent or whatever it is. But like this is what I had with my family. It's like we've got this culture in my family, a similar sort of thing of like a bit like what you were saying, your family is. If any, I guess the modern phrase is like gaslighting, like telling you your yeah. your memories are wrong or this wasn't really like that and everything's fine and then when you try when you do try and talk about it and then like i've kind of written this thing or done comedy about it or had therapy about it to try and make sense of it and that's been yeah arguably slightly selfish on my part it's been more for me you know like that working through it all yeah. and then now like my family are like why why does why does the world have to know why couldn't you we have just spoke about this it's like well i tried i've been trying to speak to you about it my whole life so it's a bit late now when it's about to go to the printers, you know. Yeah, yeah. This is it. I, I, so I have discovered as well through being more open and talking about things. I've actually realised the other side of it as well. I actually, I was a bit ungrateful as well. There were some things oh. that were done in, on for me and on my behalf that I didn't, I didn't take into account when I was when I was growing up. And now I look back and I go. I actually know there was some, I was, that was me who was a prick at that point. You yeah. know, there's stuff, like I always talk about the school that I went to. I'm like, oh, it was a, it was okay, but it was, wasn't was a great school. We weren't, there wasn't any talk of further education. There wasn't any talk about this, that and the other. You just went to school. And I suddenly remembered recently, I'm like, oh, that, but my parents didn't want me to go to that school. They wanted me to go somewhere else and they had plans and they were like, right, we want to put him in this school. Because it's the, the the numbers are better and there's better there's better facilities and this and that. But because I wanted to be with my mates, I insisted. I went, no, no, I want to go to this school. And I suddenly went, fuck yeah, that was my fault. Hmm. Yeah, you can't blame your parents you know? for everything, can you? Obviously, no. As tempting no, as no, as no. tempting as that is. But I, I'm not even doing that though. That's the thing. Like I like to think I'm taking my own responsibility for my own 
you know, unhappiness and shit or whatever it is. And also acknowledging the, yeah. the great, very good positive things about my family as well. But it's just, I think, also helpful to acknowledge the, the things that you want to try and do differently in the next generation, you know. But they don't even yeah. want to hear about that. Definitely. So, yeah. No, no, I know. And it's, I do, I, now I think back and it's kind of like on balance. You kind of go, all right, yeah, there was some shit things happened. I did some shit things. You know, and you kind of go, you can't drag, you can't drag that around forever. The things that happened weren't, they weren't catastrophic. They were just things that had happened and caused a bit of a, a bit of upset mentally here and there. But on the whole, could have been worse, wasn't. So I think out of all of this now, all the therapy I've had and all the chatting and that I've done, I'm like, yeah, okay, let's all of us move forward yeah. in a more, in a different direction to that. You know, that's what I've taken from it. Um, yeah. What I enjoyed about the, I read the beginning of your book and oh, I thanks. loved the story. Uh, the, I don't want to spoil it with people. The story that, that you know, like, is there a doctor on board? And you're like, yeah. And you go piling down, and then the, the guys, there's a guy already there, and he's trying to resuscitate this person in the aisle on the plane, and then and he looks, he's like, what sort of a doctor are you? And you, that's never happened in any film I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just just my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then I, and then I tell him I'm a psychiatrist, and then he says, "Right, well, if I manage to restart his heart, then you can ask him about his childhood." <laughs> Which was such a great opening. That and uh, I, I, that doesn't spoil anything for anybody. Hopefully, that's made people intrigued, and they go, "Oh, I need to read this." Because um, uh, straight away, it, I was engaged, and straight away, I'm like, "Oh, this is going to be excellent." Um, oh, thanks, Rich. And Thank you. Do you find that though, like you say, like because you are you are a doctor, mm. and do you find that people, like you said, like you said, people don't take mental health issues, they don't they don't see them in the same way as physical, you know, like yeah. it comes up all the time. Like if you had a, if you had a broken leg or a pain in the knee or something, you'd go and get it looked at, you'd go and get it sorted out. But when you've got a pain in your brain, you don't mm. tend to rush to seek help, which is fascinating, I find. Yeah. Well, psychiatrists, yeah, they are medical doctors who did go through medical school and then had to learn how to treat the body before the mind. But even now, they do have a slightly uncomfortable uh, position at the medical table, you know, because these things that we call mental illnesses are very different from, like, the diseases that you have in other branches of medicine. So, like, mm. that's why people, that's why psychiatrists will always be ridiculed by our fellow, by our colleagues in other specialities, it's like not proper doctors and like just social workers with stethoscopes and all these slurs that they say about us, you know, yeah. which is very valid because, like, as much as we use this jargon and we like to make out that because we now have names for things, they are established things, we are still very much in the stone ages of really understanding any of these mysterious things we call mental illnesses you know because in medicine yeah. for example like that bloke who was doing the cpr who was like a, a, a general medical doctor like usually you have a known cause for a disease like that's called the etiology and you'll have a, right. a, a you'll the, the known the known disease process which is called the pathology and then you'll have a treatment as well which is usually You'll be able to aim treatments and preventions based on those bits of information. But in mental in mental health, we don't even know what causes these things. We don't know what they are. And our treatments are really limited. So that's kind of why we are so low down in the hierarchy, uh, in people's kind of, yeah, in the reputation. Because psychiatrists have always been kind of ridiculed. as like Back in the day when they just used to th throw people in asylums and lock away the, you know, lock the door basically and everyone was just called mad there were no real other words than that people used to say that like psychiatry was just like that psychiatric hospitals or asylums were just like museums for the mad because no one ever really came out there's yeah. no movement there and then like we were supposedly like enlightened when we developed some drugs in the 50s and that led to the emptying of the asylums and people started being medicated and stuff but even now like people are realizing that that wasn't the penicillin moment that everyone thought it was because there are real limitations to these these treatments too and um so yeah we still we're still kind of very 
and in, in other areas of medicine as well like you you see like outcomes and advancements are continuing to improve whereas psychiatry is the only medical speciality where they're not only not improving on lots of measures the outcomes are getting worse so yeah right it's kind of like well how clever is what we're doing really and how how helpful is what we're doing really and that's a conflict that i sometimes have felt in my job you know yeah 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 but it's funny with the brain even even through doing this podcast over the last four years i've learned so much from from talking to people like you and you mm. know you realize that there's so many there's so many layers that are yet unexplored within human the human consciousness and everything that's going on it's like the ocean it's like there's still untapped places that people just can't get to and 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 you and you know because it's the, the, you know you answer one question but then with another question you're like well why though but why is that mm. why why do you have these weird thoughts why do you go off why does one thing set you off on a path doing something and, you know it, i find it fascinating and it, well, and, it yeah. and it at the same time i find it frightening because it just it's almost like you're never gonna know like why are we here well, in the first place like you're never gonna know it's well there you go freaks yeah. me out of it <laughs> And but it's funny because a few times you've used the word like the word brain like and, and that's funny because that's the way that we've conceptualized this human suffering most recently we've put it through this medical paradigm this language like brain defects and chemical imbalances which there's still no actual mm. we're still no actual evidence for any of that you might have heard quite recently like psychiatrists have only recently admitted oh there is no evidence for this chemical imbalance theory of depression for example which you remember was this whole idea that's been pushed on the public and like 90% of the general public think that depression is caused by low serotonin, but there's no evidence for any of that actually. Yeah. And it's like, with how we conceptualize these things has always changed. If you look at the history of psychiatry, like it used to be people thought of it in terms of like, in the ancient world, it was like divine intervention. It was like, it was kind of God and evil and demons and things. And then, after that, it was like in the Middle Ages, it was all witches and, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then only now there's been loads more since then. But then now we've had this this medical explanation. But then how appropriate that is and how helpful that is, I think people are starting to wonder, are these really are they are they really the same as physical diseases or or do we need a better a better way to conceptualize them? Yeah. yeah, because it, and it does seem to me, it does yeah. seem to me like not right, like to see, I see this a lot in my life, you know, people with like shitty lives, basically, with crap lives. And then mm -hmm. we tell them, ah, you feel low and hopeless and like life's not worth, worth living just because you got low serotonin, like rather than yeah. being mindful of the social drivers for their misery, which are much more, feel to me like much uh, uh, would be a better thing to look into probably definitely the, 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 i i mean it's like with what we do with, with with comedy and stuff and people are always saying oh you know you've just got to keep pushing keep you know you can you can achieve so much if you just keep pushing but if your skin or whatever else is going on in your life you don't feel motivated you don't feel if you and if you're living in a on a shitty estate somewhere you don't feel motivated a lot of the time to to, to do things you're just gonna you just what you're doing is surviving and that just saps all your energy and it's very difficult to people go oh well, you can you can be anything you want you can improve your life you just gotta you just gotta pull your socks up and just get out there and do it and you go but if you're if you're if you have no money coming in or you're you've got a family to support and it's whatever and you're living on some shitty state that the council don't even bother with there's, it's difficult to, to dig deep, isn't it? You know, and it, you just get left. Definitely, I think I think that is uh, it's borderline shameful, really, because that is what happens. Like these things, like depression, like all mental illnesses, cling disproportionately to poverty. They affect people more, like the people you've just described, like that that I don't yeah. know, single mum living in crappy housing with no social support, no prospects, no education, no hope, no purpose, no nothing. And then when yeah. psychiatrists just say, oh, just take this, love, it's just your brain chemistry, you'll feel better. It's kind of like that's missing the far bigger picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
which thankfully people are starting to, I think, be a little bit suspicious of this, these messages that they've been pushed about brain chemistry and blah, blah, blah. And that's obviously come from from loads of places, um, including the pharmaceutical industry, because obviously that's quite convenient for them to push their serotonin related medicines. But now people are wising up to how marginal those benefits are anyway, and the, the jury's still out about whether they're anything more than active placebos anyway. Like people are starting to look more into social prescribing, for example, or like looking to say, hang on, could we maybe change the way society is arranged be, instead of just medicating everyone? Yes. But that's a bigger task. That's a it's bigger the, task, yeah. obviously. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the people in charge of everything that basically, if you can contribute to, 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 to society that makes them more money, basically, if the, the people in charge, you're benefiting them. If you can contribute to that, then you're seen as valued and valid and they'll help you or they'll, they'll you know, there's a place for you. But if you're just someone who's, who doesn't have these opportunities or doesn't have isn't part of that you just get left they go no they they happily just you know on a on a small level with the kids school dinners people they they actively went out of their way to vote against feeding children and you go if you fed these people if you looked after them they'd be more inclined to to be part of society with which would then benefit everybody and it's such a simple thing but they never they never see that they're just interested in having all the money and all the power and if you can if you contribute to that then you're part of us but if not you can get fucked and it's, mm. it's on that basic level and I, I might be wrong but that's what it seems like to me and mm. i'm not i'm not an educated man well yeah i think this is uh, in society is so individualistic now which is a shame i think people say it was all mm. like you remember what was it thatcher said there's no such thing as society and all of that stuff and it's like we do seem to be more self-serving and looking out for ourselves which i think explains you know stuff like that which is obviously really sad because the thing is as well that yeah. self-serving materialistic yeah, that's the trap of materialism because ultimately it's empty anyway when you get all that stuff for yourself I sense, not that I've had it all, but like I know people who are very rich and they feel as empty as anyone. So it's like we're caught in this hamster wheel of chasing the thing that's actually probably not going to fulfill us ultimately anyway, which is the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on On a tiny level, I remember up until very recently... I used to be, I used to love going out shopping. Even though I didn't have any money, I always used to get a hit from getting something new. I was like, I need to go and get something new or I'd order something online or I'd do this. And then we've, like I said, we've just moved to this smaller flat in Worthing. So we haven't got any storage space. So we're now just selling stuff, giving stuff away. And I'm like, oh my God, this is all stuff I bought when I was going through that phase of, I need new things. And now I'm like, none of this means anything. I'm actually happier without it. I'm not. It's not clogging up my brain. I mean, to worry about where I'm going to put it all. Someone else has now benefited from the fact that I've just yeah, look, have this because I'm not using it. And you know, yeah, we do get caught yeah. up in that kind of oh, more things will make me more happy. And you go yeah. actually fewer things, and focusing on you know your your loved ones and whoever some or your yourself a bit you know like you know mentally and physically looking after yourself is so much more important and it's well, taken me 51 years to realize that <laughs> yeah yeah no I, to- I totally but that's that that's what we're sold isn't it that's the kind of that's how we're seduced through like marketing and everything that this will we just need this thing i always remember my mum like yeah. always used to say all she needed to be happy was this vw beetle and she was always talking about that all i need to be happy is a vw beetle and she like saved and saved and saved and saved and then she got one and then within like a few weeks i've written about it in the book but like a few weeks like she was like mm. you know back to wanting to kill herself and stuff and it's like yeah, of course that. Of course, it wasn't about the. Of course, you weren't just missing a VW Beetle in your life. That wasn't the one thing that you were missing, yeah. you know. And yeah, I think that's the yeah, other yeah, thing. Yeah. It's an interesting critique of of therapy, which is very inward looking, very introspective, 
and you know as you say like you can overthink stuff and like if you're living in the past or kind of living in these stories how happy is that making you and some people at the other extreme actually say that actually looking outside of yourself through say volunteering or altruism doing stuff for others interestingly is a really good way to make you happier as well absolutely is, um, yeah yeah that's something i've noticed through my work because when i was just taking time out i, I was like really stressed at work because like nhs psychiatry is can be quite difficult and um mm. and then i took the break and my fantasy was oh life's going to be all great and this that and the other but actually I felt like it, I forgot it was giving me a lot. Just that thing of at least, if not helping people, at least trying to help people did do something for me. It did nourish me in some way. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny on a on again on a very sort of base level. I remember every like I've given people, you know, like you give people change or give people say, or, you know, somebody or you buy something something mm. to eat or whatever. And mm. I was always in my head. I was like, oh, this is good karma. This is this will come back. And then I, I, every, every, and then up until recently, I was like, like, actually, just do it. You should just be doing it on that level. It's just like, <laughs> I want to help this person without getting anything back, without any sort of karma thing. And it's like, I just want to, I, at the end of the day, I don't want this person. The other day, there was someone, he was rummaging in the bin. And I just went, and he looked, because there's something as well where you think people have been a bit dodgy, and I know there's a lot of scammers out there. But this guy was in the bin. And he was, and he drinking and eating at his thing. I was like, mate, no, this, have this. And it was literally that. It wasn't like, oh, this is going to come back to me tenfold. It was just, I don't want you eating out of the bin, mate. <laughs> that's fucking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. the worst. And so, yeah. but it, it takes a lot to get to that point. Where you go, I'm just doing it because I want to help someone rather than I'm doing this so I get something back. It takes totally. a lot. It does. I mean, it is hard to lose the ego, though, isn't it? Or even when you're trying to do something yeah. right. Yeah, I, I had a thing where there was a, there was a guy in, it was in Brighton. I mean, this is such a Brighton story, but he was like recycling his cider cans. He was like a homeless guy recycling his cider cans, and I thought, oh, good on you, you know. And um, yeah. and 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 and, uh, and then he says, he's, you got any change? And I said, oh, not really, mate. But I'll get you some food. I'll get you some food from the shop if you want. And. Uh, He's like, all right, a meal deal, and can I get a scratch card? And I got him, I got him that, and then he was scratching it, and then he was just as, as he was scratching, I was thinking, fucking, do you know what? I could do with a hundred grand as well, you know. Like if <laughs> if this comes in, what is the arrangement here? Are we going to have this or? That's it. But then yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've said that. i have like, oh yeah, but yeah, if that comes in, that's what I've thought about that before. I'll go off, and then it'll be in the news. Homeless man wins a million. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you can't be a, you can't be a prick about it. You go, you got to go. Oh, you know what? Good on him. That was a bit of luck yeah. that day. Well done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I liked also in, in when I was reading that you were you were explaining the difference between psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, psychoanalyst, uh, psychic. Because mm. um, mm. that's you. You were right in what you were saying media and and you know tv and things like that have really kind of it's very difficult to know what the differences are yeah 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 i suppose um yeah i guess the main psychiatrist that's been in in the public consciousness or through kind of popular culture is um hannibal lecter he's the most famous psychiatrist yeah. <laughs> that yes. cannibalistic yeah, yeah, yeah. serial killer who also surprise surprise was a psychiatrist and so there's not been many uh good object not really portrayed in a in a great way but that's probably because psychiatrists do have these very unusual well as I, as we've said mental illness is very mysterious and unknown and people fear that right mm -hmm. but also on top of that psychiatrists have unusual powers you know i it's kind of you know doesn't it still doesn't sit easily with me that i have the power to take someone into hospital against their will you know to section them wow to kind yeah. of to to go against all their usual human rights to liberty and to autonomy and to decide what powerful medicines go through their veins all of that 
psychiatrists can override, you know, and I think mm. people understandably fear that because that is a slightly um, problematic thing, you know. So that's why we usually painted in very bad yeah. light in kind of Batman comics and, you know, like, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the more, the more kind of palatable yeah. end, which isn't psychiatry at all, but most people think is psychiatry is like the Woody Allen kind of image of someone in a Manhattan sort of therapy room lying on a couch talking about their mum. And that's, yeah. that's psychoanalysis tr more. That's like dip difficult. Right. That's therapy psychoanalysis. And then, um, yeah. So yeah, people get very confused about the difference. Yeah, but so think psychiatrists, psychiatrists generally is, are more mixed. Yeah, they, they, yeah psychiatrists right, right, are medical right. doctors, and they have these powers to section people and and also to medic to prescribe medications. Whereas uh, psychologists and psychotherapists and psychoanalysts, their treatment comes through words. Yeah, right. It's like kind of like unpacking everything that's yeah. going on, rather than sort of like summarizing it all and going right you need this person's going to need this medication exactly psychiatry is what? mainly just about symptom yeah. suppression so it's like mm. okay you're hearing voices you're having unusual delusional ideas that i don't know your neighbor wants to kill you or whatever then a psychiatrist will be like oh that sounds a bit like what we call schizophrenia i'll give you this antipsychotic and that'll hopefully reduce those symptoms whereas psychotherapists and psychologists and psychoanalysts would be a bit more thoughtful about it. They'd be like, "Oh, let's tr can we make any sense of this? What are the voices telling you? Yeah, might why that, is might that? Might there yeah. be some significant? Might there be some meaning to this? Why the neighbour? What's the history there? Blah blah blah." So yeah, they're just a bit more thoughtful than psychiatrists that just that 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 don't think in quite those ways. Yeah, I think going back to what you were saying about villains in movies and things like that, I think there's something mm. about the, the most sinister uh, villains in these things are ones that are like, it, it was the first time I, it was sort of, whereas before, you know, growing up, you know, the bad guy was just this thug that just wanted to take over the world or whatever. And there was, and then it started to be, there was a few that were like, they were hyper intelligent. And they understood mm. the human mind. They understand. They understand. <laughs> understood humanity better than anybody else. And someone like Hannibal Lecter uh, mm. understood like, on an animalistic level as well. You know, tapping into the animal side of his psyche. That do you know what I mean? And it, it, that sort of made it more like, fuck. I won't want to fuck around with that guy. You know, a big dude that he's going to come in and punch your head in. You kind of go, I know mm. what that guy's about, and I know what to expect. But to mm. fuck about on a on a psychological level, that's that's so much more sinister. Yeah, yeah. I think because you know we are more scared of losing our minds than anything. I think, aren't we? And of potentially ending Definitely. up in these spaces. You know, people are more fearful. It's kind of weird when people are more fearful of like psychiatric hospitals than they are prisons. You know, when you get pe people like malingering, which is like pretend it doesn't happen an awful lot, but where you get people no. pretending to be mad so that they can go to a psychiatric hospital instead of prison wow yeah 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 and it's it's funny that isn't it when people study they study how to be a certain way to get out of trouble or make their yeah. punishment less they think but they forget that if you if you're you're if you've got one of these things you're not going to have all of the symptoms you know you're going to have bits and bobs it's a bit more fluid than that but someone who comes in like textbook they've got this they're yeah. hearing voices they're doing this they're doing that that's and then you can kind of go yeah that's not, that doesn't sound right <laughs> yeah you but know. even then and the, the, what i was going to go on to say about that is people ha some people have this idea that it's going to be cushion psychiatric hospitals but at least in prison like you have an end date and you know when you're coming oh, out shit, yeah and um and also you can decide what you know you can decide if you can have treatments or not. But if you've seen that, I mean, I guess the best example of like malingering gone wrong was in that film One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest where he, he mm. kept, remember he's like trying to escape that charge yes. and then the next thing he knows he ends up like a human vegetable after having a lobotomy basically. So that, that was a bit of a backfire. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's a good point about when people, but even then this is the head fuck of psychiatry. It's like you think you have a hunch so sometimes I have this scenario where I will see people who, who 
it seems a little bit fishy. It's like, oh, are they trying too hard to seem mad or are they like, is it a bit too textbook? Are they using medical jargon? Does the story really fit with, say, like a, a true schizophrenia sort of picture? And so I'll have to make this really awkward, uncomfortable decision of saying, well, I actually think that they're, they're trying it on, which means they'll go down oh, the wow. criminal justice system and go to go to prison. But even then, I can never be 100 percent because there's no no head scan for schizophrenia. There's no blood test for depression. It's still no. just this gray world. Oh, so you never you never you. really know. It's just on you and you just have to live with that. Yeah. And um. And that's the thing. That's why you need to hold these ideas of diagnosis so lightly because, you know, when, especially in comedy nowadays where everyone's identifying as having this, that or the other and they say my this or my that. And it's like, well, hold on a second. You do need to... You sound unduly certain about these things because don't forget that having a diagnosis, all that means is that some person in a room with you one time said they think you've maybe matched the diagnostic criteria for this thing, you know? Yes. That's really not set in stone. And if you meet 10 different psychiatrists and say the same thing, you could leave with as many different diagnoses. So... Yeah, I know what you mean. It's yeah. one of those, especially in comedy at the minute, everybody wants to be diagnosed with something weirdly. And you're kind of like, you just, to just, you know... You, Hold, hold fire. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, it's, I mean, there are people that have got, I've said this before, and I'm not knocking anybody, uh, but there are people that have got, you know, hugely debilitating levels of ADHD and uh, autism and anything else that's, that, that's happening that they've oh, they're only now just kind of like discovering that they have and now they're getting some kind of peace. They go, oh, well, that makes sense now. That's why my entire life has been so tricky because I've been trying to be forced into this position of this, but I'm not actually that. I'm this. I'm, this other stuff's been going on. But then there are other people that you can see it, and they're kind of trying to cling on to something because they want to be a part of the part of the noise. And you're like, just uh, mm. you don't need to. If you haven't, if you haven't got it, <laughs> don't try and find it. Mm. <laughs> you know. That, just, uh, yeah. I don't know. We it, it, again, it'd be it'd be another. Again, it's that massive overcorrection where yes, we just should all be talking about it. And then it will kind of level out again when everyone, you know, we all we all talk about something else. Maybe I don't know. To, I think so. To sound like it, not, you know, yeah. Go on. Yeah. No, I think so because having that identity and having that label explain all the problems you have in your life is probably only going to last for so long. You know, I think yeah. as we are, as you often see, people the moment they get their diagnosis, a lot of the time, it, as you say, it's that sense of relief. Ah, an explanation for why life has been so hard from someone in a white coat. Ah, this all makes perfect sense. But then as life goes on a lot of the time and they realize that's really a little bit overly simplistic and reductive, you know, and actually it probably doesn't mm. explain away everything. Um, and yeah, and also like ADHD has become, I mean, it's so overly diagnosed now, it's almost become like meaningless in what it even means, hasn't it? Like if you've ever done one of those like ADHD screening tools, which I have, and then at the end it says, oh, I have symptoms consistent with ADHD and to go seek medical advice. And it's like, well, I really don't think, I mean, yeah, I'm sometimes restless and distractible and impulsive, but it's like, I I feel like that's more a symptom of like living in this hyper-connected digital 21st century world when I have a mobile yeah. phone and every company is vying for my attention more than like a brain defect, you know? And, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure there's there's quite a bit of that going on. And I think people, are, again, are being suspicious of like, I don't know if you saw, saw that Panorama documentary on ADHD. Did you see that? No. No, it's about like it was about like um, people how this is another thing that often happens. And like people will say to me, like if you will say you, some, it's a very as you say, it's a very weird thing where when I used to work in general medicine, it would usually be like really great news. I'd say, hey, Rich, great news. Um, I don't think you've got this illness. Like, I think you're OK. And you'd like be pleased with that. Yeah. But at the milder end of things with these more desirable labels like ADHD or autism or whatever the thing is, whatever's in vogue at that time, I then would say that to patients sometimes and they'd, hey, the good news is, which I don't think you've got this, that or the other. 
and they'd be kind of like furious, you know, right? Like, what, yeah. As you say, like like wanting like wanting it. And so then they'd go away and they'd come back to me and say, oh, well, you know, have you missed my diagnosis. I went private and they've discovered my diagnosis. Like it's this objective truth. But then if you if you watch this ADHD diagnosis, you just see how what nonsense it is, where it's just like you pay a grand. Someone will see you on Zoom, ask you if you get bored queuing in a post office, ask you if you're on your phone too much, ask you if you're if you have 20 tabs open on your Internet at any one time. Basically, just asking you questions that all human beings do anyway. Then they'll give you yeah. a diagnosis and send you on your way, and then you'll be paying exp expensive prescriptions with them for the rest of your life. So, I think people watching that yeah. are like, "Oh, this is um, it's a very limited, a very limited model that we have of the current di classification system for mental illness is really limited, basically." Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's people I know that. There's a friend of mine, um, and she's she's for years, years, and years, and she she lives in Scotland, and we we we, we chat all the time. But she was telling me that, and she has she struggled her whole life with with you know ADHD and not knowing that that's what it was. You know, she mm. and she's had you know high pressure jobs, high profile jobs, and she's and so she always felt like she couldn't quite. She was all like, "What well, should be? I just get on with this and do that and the other." And then. When she finally got the diagnosis, she's like, oh, "Fuck yeah! Now that make it all makes sense, and that's amazing. That's that's it, yeah." But then, I, like you say, that the milder end when you say, "I see it now," and people are just like, "Oh, you know, I I I forget this or I do that," and I'm like, "Yeah, I do that." Like you said, we all do that, you know. Mm. And more often than not, if you're in the arts, you probably are more. You probably do have some kind of ADHD or something like that, which is why you're in that on that side of things in the first place because if you didn't you may be working in an office and a bit more regimented and you'd quite like that i'm not saying people that work in offices don't have this ADHD, but they seem mm. to be people more in the arts seem to have more more of it rather than people that you know nine to five happy with doing that you know they got their they got their 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 rituals and their bits and bobs and you know mm. i mean of course it's a sweeping statement and i'm dealing with you know i'm not saying everybody but that's what it seems yeah. to be i think if you're in the arts You've probably got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, th I think level. the way I think about it, the way I think about it is, if it's helpful for you to give these things a name, these behaviours a name, and that serves you well, well then that's not really hurting anyone, I guess. So fair enough. But some people actually find, in my experience, with other labels like schizophrenia or bipolar, the more serious end, actually having that label can be as bad as having the thing itself, like mm. the way that society will like ostracize you and fear you and ignore you and not involve you, for example. So I'm kind of wary of using labels unnecessary unless you really need to. And I guess the only thing that slightly feels unjust to me in the whole ADHD thing is how in the mental health conversation, it is generally high functioning people with mild, if any issues and often just it's mainly armchair self diagnoses a lot of the time isn't it really that yeah. are kind of dominating this whole mental health conversation and the problem with that is that it just really waters down what it actually means to have a debilitating disabling mental illness and people who yes. actually have those people think oh what are you making such a fuss like they think they're they just get even more lost. They just get even more left behind and they get even less of a voice and they get even less of the resources that there aren't even enough going as it is. You know, if there were endless yeah. resources that we could, you know, send a psychiatrist and a psychologist and blah, blah, blah to everyone who thought they were a little bit distractible or whatever, fine. But given how much mental health funding has been cut, it's kind of, and we can't even help the people at the severe end of things... Like until yeah. until then, my priority is really just going to be trying to give those guys a bit more of a voice, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as you say, as we talked about earlier, these if you're not contributing, then society kind of goes, "You're not necessary." Then we're just going to ignore you and focus on the people that can contribute to this. And there's well, so yeah. many people that just get, like you say, that just get left, and and you just don't have the resources. And it's, I it breaks my heart that there are people that just think. That they're worthless because of that. It's shocking, and and that's what that's yeah. what I sometimes that's what I've, I've had to caught, catch myself. You know, 
my speciality, I guess the the main people that I work with is people with more serious mental illness, like schizophrenia, and people. Mm. And so those are people who hear voices and have delusional ideas. And because of unhelpful ideas that have been pushed through the media, you know, sensationalist, you know, news reporting or films or whatever it is, people have this really over over exaggerated idea about the risk that such people pose you know when you see those front yes. pages on the rare occasion that someone chops someone's head off or does something quite bizarre you know and so the kind of the that means that unfortunately all people with that diagnosis now people are so wary of them they want them to be medicated on the off chance that they may be do something horrendous, even though they they most of them never will. And they're much more likely to no. be victims of violence, and like booze and drugs are much bigger risk factors of vi- than for violence than having schizophrenia. But you know, no yeah, one seems to yeah. care about going to parties. You know, and it's like, but the the cost of that to those people with that diagnosis, society, people like me, are encur- we just have to medicate them. And sometimes I would see a patient with a diagnosis like like that and they'd be on medication and they'd just be sitting in the house watching TV and eating takeaways and sleeping 18 hours a day, but not causing anyone any bother, like just just zombies, basically. And I'd be writing in the notes, patient doing well, just existing. And I'd be sometimes writing patient doing well see review in six months or whatever. And then I'd catch myself being like, in what world is this is this doing well? Yeah, he's not posing a particular risk to anyone. But as you say, like, there's a difference between being alive and living. And, like, we should demand a better... We need a better arrangement than that, you know, than just medicating people. So they're essentially still are in asylums, really, but they're just in chemical chains, you know? They're just out of sight and out of mind. They're just just living in their houses where no one can see them. Exactly. Yeah. And it's always... Is there, so when you see, when people do hear voices, is there, now I know this is a clunky, stupid way of asking it, I don't really know how else to say, but it always seems to be, that it's always, it's always, they're always negative voices, that not necessarily say kill your neighbour, but they always seem to be arguing with somebody, or they're always, mm. there's always, a, there's, there's a friction, and a, it's never like, oh, I've just been hanging out with my mate, and you're going, oh, okay. But it's always. Is there a reason for that? Is it because humans sort of err on the side of negativity, or is it just? This is something I've I always think, wanted to know. I don't really know. You know, yeah, it's, it's a good question. To be honest, they're not always negative. It's. I think how psychiatrists talk about right. it is it. It would be kind of like the voices are usually congruent with the mood. So, like, if for example, in paranoid oh. schizophrenia, that's where you have where let's use that neighbour wants to kill you example. The, cause that'll be the delusional idea. So the void, which is quite a persecutory, um, negative a- idea. And so the, yeah. the voices will be in, in keeping with that. But then, for example, in mania, which is where you get in more bipolar, when people are kind of going up and having a manic episode, when they're, they'll actually be like 10 out of 10 happy, walking on cloud nine, like basically... Um, like like when it is when people are high on drugs, basically, but just all of the yeah, time. Yeah, like, and then, like Richard and then the Hardesty. Voices, just like yeah. your boy Rich, exactly. And and and, yeah. and then and then, but then the voices then will be kind of like in keeping with that. They'll be like, "Oh, Rich, you are Superman, or you are, you know how he yes. has all of that. You're you're Superman, or you're yeah. God, you're Jesus." So the mood is they're not always negative. They're in keeping with the mood. Yeah, but Rich is a yeah, is a yeah, is, is, is a good friend of mine, and like, yeah, he he's a kind of he again is another example of the limitations of these classification systems because he's been he's been labelled with everything. So has he got everything, or, or has he got everything, or has he got nothing, or is he just a a complicated, you know, um, boy with a with a with a with a traumatic early life, you know? He told me they've just diagnosed him with ADHD. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, how how is a diagnosis of yeah. ADHD going to help him now when he's already got borderline anorexia, yeah. bipolar? Um, I mean, take your pick. I know, and having spent time with him, so I so I sort of met him through a mutual friend of my wife's uh, and my, my, a friend of my wife's, and there she was friends with Rich. And I remember we got to Edinburgh last year, and then she was like, "You have to go and see this show. Richard is brilliant." 
And I'd never heard of him before, and I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. And as you know, I saw you like three times. I'm like, I can't get enough of this mm. show. And yeah, then yeah, having spent incredible. time with him, it's a, oh man, it was so emotional. I cried every time. And I did again when I supported him on tour, and having spent some time with him in the car and just hanging around with him, and you see that not he's not he's not trying to he's almost trying to suppress himself he's trying to like sit on him like sit on his hands because he can see he's he's like he has to do certain things a certain way otherwise he, he feels like he's just gonna just explode and lose it at some point you know like it just felt like he was rather than trying to express himself he was trying not to almost which was something i hadn't mm. seen before right yeah, no, he's a, he's, a, he's a special guy, Rich, and like, and I guess that's mm. the other thing. It's like some he's got a really great psychiatrist who I actually know, um, yeah. who's kind of more of the school of uh, more kind of in, I I think we think in a similar sort of way. Like he doesn't just want to suppress symptoms because actually, as we've said, Rich is a special guy, and yeah, other yes. people that have picked up diagnoses like that could be living the life that that he, they could be those guys sitting in their be, uh, a flat share, sleeping 18 hours a day, drooling, overweight from all these antipsychotics they're on, just not causing yeah. anyone bother, not really getting to live. Whereas yeah. Rich is like really alive and really living. And, oh, um, God, yeah. Inspirational. And I think that's a much better thing to, to promote, definitely, rather than to sedate him and seduce him. And, sorry, than to sedate him and bring him all down, you know? Yeah. Because he's not causing anyone any bother, which he isn't generally, apart from... Yeah, when he has a little wobble or whatever. But that's when I came in to support him when he had one of those wobbles. That's why I was always at uh, the Pleasance to try and, like, you know, just keep him chilled and everything. And then the rest of his run was great. Yeah, yeah. And he's one, of, and I think that's what needs to happen. I think, like you said before, society needs to, to, be, to, to, be, to get a more under... If rather than changing these people... We, society needs to change so we can accommodate them and understand them or exactly what you said earlier like you know having been around rich like we said and you do this mo like he he talks to you and he goes right he goes is this is this in place is that in place and you go yeah yeah no, it's all good man it's all good and that's what we as a society mm. needs to be but as you say we're also sort of single-minded and focusing on ourselves rather than people around us it's a, it's it's hopefully we're we're sort of like the first wave maybe and change will come in future generations. I don't know. But that's what needs to happen. People, again, think they want to talk about mental health, but, again, it's at the super mild, mild end of things. And we really yeah, need it's to... Definitely, that is, that is just, yeah. The mild end yeah, of things, on. which is arguably not even mental health, which is arguably just problems of living, the everyday pain of being a human being a lot of the time, you know, yes. and we're just over medicalizing everyday life a lot of the time. Yeah. That's the sort of stuff that people seem to want to talk about. But when you actually get some challenging real stuff, it's a bit much for people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was this like when, so the other week there was somebody, um, someone messaged in our in a WhatsApp group and said, hey, do you know this guy? And we all kind of went, yeah, I sort of know him, yeah. They went, well, I think he's he's on the edge. Um, I think he needs talking down. So we, so everyone jumped on it. We were sort of privately messaging him and getting trying to get hold of him. But you could see people, like you said, people are all right talking about it like this. Oh, let's talk about mental health. But when something actually happens, you'd be. It's interesting to see how few people get involved. You know, how actually, you know, I've I've said to people before, I'm like, drop me a message if you like, um, if you're feeling it. And people, some people have. Um, and we have, we've had a bit of a back and forth, but and then every now and again, I'll you you kind of go, oh, I can't, oh shit, I haven't replied to that person because life gets in the way or whatever. Or, or, but yeah, you'd be surprised how many people don't want to get involved when it's actually happening. They're all right talking about it, mm. like say with mm -hmm. Rich, you know, when he has when, if he's had a moment and people are, like you say, if it's not neatly packaged and oh yeah, that's we're, we're dealing with mental health because we've got this show on our books, and then when it's like yeah. I don't think he's, I don't, I think not just Rich, but other people is kind of go, something's happening here. And, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We, we haven't got the, we haven't got the facilities for that. Take him away. Go and take him around the block for a walk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We need to be more, yeah. we need to have more of an understanding, don't we? Really of how to, or, how, or know how to, how to cope on both sides. When the, when people are actively physically 
or, or openly struggling. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's definitely right. And it's not unfair to kind of like. It's not that people are, are unkind or cruel or anything. I think they just don't have the experience. Whereas, like, for example, yeah. me hanging around Rich, like, I just, I mean, that is my, that's my, Rich is still at the mild end of things compared to my day job, you know? So I find, I find that all very tolerable and very easy. But to people who haven't been exposed to quite extreme levels of mental illness, it's mm-hmm. sort of, I, I get, I get why they might, might not go towards that and if anything go away from it yeah as you say it's like with the way people that are portrayed in films and tv you know it's yeah people like they don't know they don't really know so so they are scared to get to engage with these people the kind of Mm. it's that isn't it it's fear that's the thing that stops us doing anything isn't it on any level it's the fear Mm. of something it's like i'd rather not get involved with that because i don't understand it you know, I don't get it. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I can't deal with that. So this is what we need to do. It's like we like you say, try and change the framework that we're in. So we've all got a better understanding yeah. all around, I think. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you, you totally see that. Like yeah. I, I had um, a patient of mine who, um, I mean, you see it if you ever get on, like, if you ever on like a bus or in the park or like, you know, and you just see people talking to themselves. And like I had a patient who, yeah, he'd always be on the but he'd always be talking to himself on the buses, you know. He'd like ride the buses. Right. That was like his. Yeah. That was his thing, and he and he'd talk to the voices because they were the only. You know, it was this really sad thing when I would say to him, "Oh, could you want me to increase the meds to quieten the voices?" And he'd say to me, "Nah, some of them are nice, and 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 um, also they keep me company, you know, wow. because no one else does. Like everyone else has left him, yeah. and when he gets on a bus." He's that bloke on the top deck of the bus where he's talking to his voices and everyone's come down to the bottom deck because they're so fearful of him. And, like, I'll try and refer him to, like... I once refer, I tried to refer him to this garden community thing because he used to be a gardener before he was unwell. And, like, they were, like, right. buzzing about, oh, yeah, no, we love volunteers, we love this, that, and the other. And then she asked where I was calling from and I was said I had said this psychiatric hospital. And then she was like, ah... And then she was like asking his yeah. diagnosis, and I told her his diagnosis was schizophrenia, and she was like, "Right, will he be safe around the general public?" You know, all of that sort of nonsense well, coming yeah. out. You know, so yeah, people still have these really unhelpful misconceptions about the dangerousness of people that hear voices and that have odd ideas. When, as I say, they're they're really not; they're massively over exaggerated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But this is it. This is why we have to keep pushing on. Like the the work you're doing is so important. You know, it it might seem you know like just a you know a small thing, but it it will lead to a bigger thing. I'm sure. Absolutely. If we just keep pushing on and keep having the conversations, you know, because now because now I now having the conversation with you now, I have a I have more clarity around this subject, which I didn't have before. I just, you know, paranoid schizophrenia. Go, oh, well, they're going to just go and, like you said, chop heads off and they're going to go off on some sort of killing spree. And that's not, mm. that's just what's been put into my head through films and whatever else. So, yeah. and hopefully people listen to this, but then again, they'll have a bit more clarity surrounding it as well. Which is, that which would is be a, good. Which yeah. is a great thing. That's, yeah. Yeah. That I would, that would be good to try and get that across. Um, yeah. Because I know, uh, yeah, totally, totally. Because yeah. I, th- I think that's the other thing. Like you know, you I know, um, I know you a, a colleague of mine, Shaham Das. You've spoke to him, haven't yes. you? Yes, yeah, he's a, a forensic of times. psychiatrist. Yeah. yeah, and he's a forensic psychiatrist, and it's like, yeah, we are very, uh, you know, this true crime genre and like the forensic psych side of things. We are very fascinated yeah. by that. But that's like we're flooded with that. That's the main. It's like his sort of stuff, which is not not saying anything. It's not his fault. But like it's almost like the more forensic psychiatry stuff gets pushed, it's like the more obviously when that's all we get exposed to as people, we just presume oh they're all like that, you know. Whereas those yeah. are just the minority of people that do horrendous things in the context of being unwell. And so obviously we're going to generalise if that's our only, if that's the only people we ever have exposure of with a diagnosis like schizophrenia, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you find, talking about that actually, about uh, Shahom, uh, 
and I think I said this to him as well. Do you find yourself just reading people all the time? Just kind of, just in general, kind of like, oh yeah, I see what's going on here. Like just on a, you know, you know, on a sub sort of conscious level, you kind of, because people give, people give away so much about actually saying anything. Well, this is the, um, this is the thing though, Rich, this is like where people seem to think I have skills that I don't, you know, where they think right. I, I can't, like people always say that, like at, at parties, like at, sometimes I would literally make up other jobs because if I told people my job, they'd just leave so quickly because they thought I could read their mind. So I was telling people I was a, I once told someone I was a soldier and like another time I was like a, just had a bit of fun with these made-up jobs, and literally any you can pick any other job, and you'll probably hold them. You could say you work in an abattoir or anything. You'll probably keep them longer than if you say you're a psychiatrist. You tell people you're a psychiatrist, they run a mile because <laughs> they, they think they think I have yeah. Yeah, they think I they think I can see into their soul and know all these things they don't even know about them. <laughs> If this only, you know. When I, yeah, when I've had it on stage and you say to someone, like, what do you do? You know that tired bullshit thing that we all do. Oh, what's your name? What do you do? And the amount of times I've had, oh, I'm a psychiatrist or I'm a psychoanalyst or that. And I always make a joke, well, I'm not going to talk to you because not only do you know do you know what's going on up here, or you know you know exactly, you know, not only do you know why I do this, you know, like my driving thing, so yeah. I'm not going to talk to you because I don't want you to unpick this. And it, you know, and we do straight away, we're like, oh, you, you've got superhuman strength and yeah. super, superhuman powers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they just, go along with it. You see straight through us. Yeah. Yeah. They, and they go along, along with it. Because it. it's semi-flattering. It's semi-flattering that people think we could possibly be that powerful, you know? <laughs> but the reality <laughs> is that, unfortunately, no, no. You'd be exhausted. Every every interaction you ever had, and you were listening to them, but you're on a, psych on a subconscious level, you're reading them. And reading between every single line, you'd be fucked. <laughs> you'd just never. Yeah. It'd be like a, like a psychic who goes out and all they hear is people trying to get, get in touch with relatives. It'd just be, exactly. can you fuck off for a bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that is what always happens, you know, that is what always happens to me when I've got a joke about it, even when, like, you know, I get in a black cab and the guy will go, I'll tell him my job and he'll go, go on and what am I thinking? Like, people always <laughs> think... <laughs> You're a clairvoyant. Are you a? You're a. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can read minds. <laughs> but I think yeah. you mentioned that in the, when you said the difference between a psychoanalyst and a psychiatrist, and a psychic, and yeah, you know, I do find I do find, I no, I think it's just intuition rather than having any sort of skill. I think having been a lying sack of shit when I was growing up, when I was a child, when not not a child, when I was younger. You know, I was always mucking around. I was in relationships and I'd cheat on people because I hadn't sorted my shit out. And now when I hear people talking, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're up to no good, mate. I know exactly what that is. You know what I mean? You can kind of pick up on stuff. But I think mm. that's more because I've, that's more lived experience rather than having any kind of, yeah. psych, you know, any kind of psychic power. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, you don't get taught. There's, I mean, how do you even teach that? Yeah, you, you don't, you don't, psychiatrists don't get taught that. Psychiatrists, it's very much just kind of rote learning, really. And um, this symptom right, plus okay. that symptom plus the other symptom equals this diagnosis. And um, yeah, it's not, not too clever, really, to be honest. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just that. Yeah. Have you ever had someone like telling you stuff and you're like, fuck, this is, this is pretty heavy, actually? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't need oh, to. Yeah. You know, I don't need to. Patient, it's patient, you know, patient, doctor, confidentiality. But there must have been a time where you go, fuck, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, mate. I mean, that it's, it's, it's all like that, though. It's all like that because, like, to, to meet the threshold to see someone like me in the NHS is, is so high now. You've got to be at that level and then some to even see an NHS psychiatrist now. Do you know what I mean? You're not going to get through the door with yeah. anything mild. So it's all like that. And then, then there is the, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all like that. And then obviously that can impact on you because, you know, this stuff can stick if you're just spending your, your day job around human misery you know that that does inevitably stick at some point a, a little bit you know 
Yeah. Um, and that's why psychiatrists have got notoriously bad mental health themselves. And it's why it's like when I first started as a psychiatrist, my, um, my boss was, uh, she was like having my first supervision session and, uh, it was boiling in her office on the psych ward. And I was like, can we open a window to get some air? And she was like, oh, they don't open up here. And I was like, what, even the psychiatrist offices? And she said, especially in the psychiatrist offices. Wow. Because psychiatrists have like the worst. Psychiatrists are notorious for killing themselves and having really bad mental health and substance misuse problems. But of course they would be. Partly because, you know, they're slightly, they're usually quite complicated people that are attracted to that job in the first place. And then obviously yep. being around all this stuff doesn't help much either, usually. I um, know exactly what you mean. On another level where I used to work in a care home. And so you, you saw what happens to people at the end. And that really affected mm. me. I used to take it home and just be, I was talking to my, when I was with the mother of my kids and I'd come in and she was like, how was it? I'm like, it just makes me sad that that's where most people end up. You get to a point where you can't fend for yourself. You can't even take care of yourself. And you're just kind mm. of just waiting to just finish. And that really affected mm. me on that level. So if you're talking to people about, really heavy heavy subjects you, mm. you it would take again you'd have to be superhuman to not have any mm. of that you know go inside you at some point sure so that's why you've just got to cling to the you know the small victories that you get you know you, you people you know some people do get better and like there aren't really any cures for it there's no cure for schizophrenia for example you just kind of have relapses and remissions and you just kind of have good good times and not good times and yeah yeah you've just got to try and celebrate the the good times and try and yeah but it, it can be hard because it's like you know when I used to work in medicine and surgery and stuff like you'd you'd be having great outcomes and you'd be getting lots of thank you cards from patients and chocolates and stuff whereas you don't really get that in psychiatry because you know the outcomes aren't there yet I mean no, no, I suppose it's an ongoing those. thing, isn't it? You're helping people cope with what's happening rather than yeah. curing it, like you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's harder to find job satisfaction sometimes, you know? Yeah. Harder to feel that you're making a Did real you... difference. If you go into medicine to make a difference, and it's kind of hilarious when I think about it now, when I went for my medical school interview, and they were kind of on about, how do you want to change the world? And then I think about where we're at sometimes in psychiatry now where we've got certain patients and we're, they're so disabled that we're just celebrating the fact that they went to the shop to get some milk or whatever. And that's a victory yeah. for us, you know, and it's you're thinking, bloody hell, it's not quite saving the world. But it is in a way, you know, you just got to, you're just trying to get people to live as, as normal a life in society as they can, I guess. But yeah, we still yeah. still need a lot, need still a long way, long, long, long way to go. So when people think we're super enlightened compared to, this is the hilarious thing that people always seem to think, like, oh, we know everything now. We're super enlightened. Like those guys in yeah. the past when they were doing lobotomies and, you know, shock therapy and, you know, all this stuff, all these barbaric things, they didn't have a clue. But then inevitably no. in the history of psychiatry, like you need to remember at that time, everyone thought those were great ideas, you know, everyone thought they worked like the, the guy who created the, 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 the lobotomy got a Nobel yeah. prize in medicine at the time. So wow, wow. like just, just it'd be very naive to think that my grandkids won't be shaking their heads at the things that I've been doing as a psychiatrist, you know, they're going to be having exactly the same thoughts. I'm pretty sure. But this is it, isn't it? There's no, as you say, we, with humanity, there's just this ongoing, there's just the journey. There isn't really the destination because we're always discovering and then debunking and then changing. And that just goes on and on and on until humans won't be here anymore. We'll be on to the next species or whatever else comes along. But mm. I, for one, am glad that people like you exist. And because you've given me so much clarity today, and uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. So let's let's finish. When's the book coming out? Do you know yet? Or is that still ongoing? Because it's at the printers. You've got to wait. Because it's at the... Well, the, I've got to get it past my family first. But 
I've got to yeah. get it past my family, but uh, the current plan is uh, my publishers want it to come out spring 2024. Okay. Yeah, so look out for it then. Um, it's going to be called Yeah, do. You Don't Have to Will Be do. Mad to Work Here. And that's published Excellent by time. Penguin. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, and you're going to be in Edinburgh this year? Yeah, I'm doing a show also called You Don't Have to Be Mad to Work Here at uh, Pleasance Courtyard at half four for our August. So, yeah, hopefully that'll be good as well. Excellent. I'm sure it will be. I'm sure you'll smash it. You're a, you're a very talented man. I'm not just blowing smoke up your ass. I think you're great. Thanks, mate. And thank yeah, you for come coming along. on. You might enjoy it. It's literally same room, same time yeah. that Rich had. I thought, you know, so, uh, yeah, yeah, you'd be super Oh, excellent. Welcome. That's a perfect little room. Yeah, excellent. Nice room. I mean, little. It? I mean, yeah. uh, just, I don't mean, oh, it's only two seats. It's a, it's a lovely room. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. excellent room. Perfect. But this has been great. And where can we find you on all the socials? Um, I'm Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R underscore Benji. Yeah, on on Twitter and then Dr. Underscore Ben G's on Instagram. Yeah, those are the main places, really. Yeah. Fantastic. Benji, thank you so much, mate. It's been an absolute joy to speak to you. Um, and we'll do this again next week, everybody. This has been Insane yeah. in the Membrane. I've been Rich Wilson. This has been Benji Waterstones. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Rich. Cheerio. Yes.